This is FBG Jen and FBG Kristen. And I'm FBG Margo, host and producer. You're listening to the podcast that will help you keep a lid on the junk in the trunk and inspire you to live a happy and confident life. Each episode, we chat with motivational experts and celebs and share our own candid adventures in being healthy. If you're looking for a podcast that's equal parts hilarious and enlightening, well then welcome to the Fit Bottom Girls podcast. Inspire yourself, inspire others, and smell great naturally with Inspire Bath deodorant sprays and lotions. We use them, we love them, and we think you will too. So just go to inspirebath.com. Welcome back to the Fit Bottom Girls podcast. This is FBG Margo, and on the line today, we have FBG Jen. Hey. And we have FBG Kristen. Yo. And my God, we guys, we just love, love, love this interview today with Patricia Moreno. And I want to give a shout out to Terry Cole, by the way. We interviewed her last year, the year before in December in 2016. Um, we were in touch with her recently, and she recommended that we have Patricia for the show. And thank you so much, Terry, because I don't know about you guys. I just thought she was fantastic. Spot on. Loved her. Loved the interview. It was so like riveting I felt like her story was just full of drama but just truth and intensity and wisdom and bravery and yeah I I I loved it yeah there's definitely something there for everyone to relate to 100 percent and I have to say this is one of the times where we asked a question. We usually, I start first usually, and I ask the first question. And I think she talked for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and we barely even broke in. But she was so interesting, and she really was just putting it all out there, you know, her life story. Yeah. Uh, and we were, I think, I don't know about you guys, but I was sort of gobsmacked at her, her bravery and just how open and honest she was with us. I kind of thought we were talking to her for the podcast. Like, I almost got so, like, it almost felt like I was entranced in the interview because it was so fascinating. Yes. I was like, oh, yeah, wait, I need to, like, ask a <laughs> question now or something. Like, <laughs> I'm not just watching a TED Talk. It's kind of almost like what it felt like in some ways. It's really good. It's really good. It's a must listen. And that's why we divided it into two parts. And so, Jen, please tell us your experience where with your first Her Intensati class. Yeah, so I dug back into the FBG archives, and this shit goes back a long ways. It goes back to 2011, and I can't remember when she said she started in Tensade. Um, I think she says it in the interview, but I was, like, going back through the archives of the site, but then also, like, the archives of my brain. I was like, what? I, I, I took a class. I can't remember if it was actually Patricia that reached out to us and said, you should try a class here, or it was actually just this local gal who was teaching classes at the time. I'm not sure if she is any longer whose name was Natalie George. I think her name is, I think she's actually changed her name now, like or something. But she was the instructor that I ended up going to this class to here in Kansas City. And I even made a video, guys. And I forgot that I made a video. So really, if you kind of want to see what some of a class is like in action, I can pop that link to that post and that video in. But I got to tell you, the video quality is low because, again, it was 2011. And I was using, like, movie maker or whatever <laughs> comes free on a desktop computer like I don't even know, oh <laughs> know. I can't remember what I used but what's also hilarious is that like it starts out and I'd set the camera to watch like basically to see the class and to see the interest there's just a few minutes of like the class you can get a feel for it with music and it is from the very beginning of it very very I mean heart-centered heart heartfelt and I remember being in the class and especially when I saw the video it really took me back to that time and I remember it almost feeling like therapy in a way because it was like connect your body and you're you know aware of your emotions and you're in charge of your emotions and you should feel that and feel your power and I think in 2011 you know there wasn't as much kind of talk about you know your energy and connecting with yourself and it wasn't quite as mean soon as it was and that the class really really resonated with me like such a deep level um, and then after in the video you see a little bit of the class and then it cuts to me interviewing the instructor and <laughs> it's only from like our shoulders up <laughs> 
because I had to go in and it's like really poor quality. This is really, really laughable. Like give it a like on YouTube <laughs> because I remember that I was wearing some sort of sports bra that didn't have the modesty padding or like the, <laughs> the cups. <laughs> Oh, I remember getting the video back and her and I had this, you know, great interview and she's saying this great. And, and then my, me nipping out is so distracting, or at least I felt uncomfortable with it at the time um, in my shirt. that I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to cut this, but I, I don't particularly want to put that on YouTube either. So um, yeah, I figured out a way in that, that old software to just cut that off. So if that shot looks weird, that's the backstory on why. <laughs> I love that story. Yeah, it was good. I didn't, I didn't want to cut it, so it's there. But it was really, really good. And I imagine that, you know, since then, I'm sure her classes have evolved to even be, you know, more in depth and more amazing. Because after that many years, I mean, things evolve. So, I definitely recommend anyone check out a class and laugh at that video. We'll put, the, we'll include the link. Well, she. Well, speaking of evolving, I mean, she talks with us today about her evolving idea of what it means to be a fitness pro professional. And at what time in her, at a certain time in her life, she was very connected with that idea of like, she needs to be thin. She needs to be presented in a particular way. She had a very popular show at the time and she was got, getting those kinds of feedback. And then she just sort of realized like, I'm sending out the wrong message. You know, I am, I am promoting something that I think I realize now it is, you know, being thin at any cost is a terrible message to send out to people. It's dangerous and it could kill them. And so she it's changed all that. She has changed her thinking on it. She changes how she presents herself. She changes her, her wording. And I just thought that was a really brave thing to do after being in the industry for so long and being so successful at it. And, yeah. and so she talks about why she decided to do that. And like I said, you guys, I mean, this is a, it's a, it was an hour interview we had with her and one of the best we've ever done. And I, I know, I, I know you guys felt the same way. I just thought she was so inspiring. Yeah. And her, in some ways, her story mirrors my own when I was working in fitness and I felt like, oh my gosh, I really have to like look this certain way in order to give fitness advice. I think that pressure is really, really strong on fitness professionals. Um, but, I, but obviously her, her, what I was never on the platform that she was on and the platform she was on was huge. And I feel the pressure that I felt was just pretty much for myself. So I can't imagine having that pressure for myself, plus, you know, executives, and that is actually your full career. And then she took really extreme, extreme measures. It's crazy. Yeah, y'all will find out when you listen to this episode. I mean, there's a couple of times it takes you think you know what she's gonna say. And then she makes a left turn. And you're like, Oh, wow. I didn't expect that to yeah. happen in this narrative. So once again, you guys are just going to totally love this episode. But that's why we put it into two parts. So today is part one. And please, you know, follow us on social media. Um, it's all at Fit Bottom Girls. Send us an, you want to send us an email, it's podcast at fitbottomgirls.com. And if you leave us a review in iTunes, and please be sure to subscribe. That way you'll never miss an episode. Please, it's for Fit Bottom Girls. And if you leave it in Apple Podcasts, if that's where you get your podcast, if you leave a, us a five-star review, we will read it on the air. So, y'all, let's get ready for part one with Patricia Moreno. Remember, this show is sponsored by our fave all-natural deodorant line, Inspire Bath. In fact, for every bottle you purchase, they donate one to help build and empower women and girls at shelters and interim homes. Get yours and help give back at InspireBath.com. Our guest Patricia Moreno has been training, mentoring, and educating people all over the world for over 30 years. In an effort to end her own struggle with her weight, eating disorders, and body image issues, she created the Intensati 2 Method, a life-transforming workout which combines her expertise in fitness, dance, martial arts, yoga, nutrition, meditation, and spiritual practices. Encouraged by her own transformation and the life-changing stories of her students, Patricia has gone on to create several other workouts, courses, and workshops, including Yoga Sadi, Warrior Sadi, Core Sadi, Dance Sadi, and the Intel Sadi Leadership Training. She is committed to being a powerful force for positive change in the world and continues to find revolutionary ways to uplift her students and help them to change inside and out. Patricia believes that through conscious, intentional living, a commitment to excellence, and the power of love 
every person is able to live a life filled with peace, happiness, and joy. Welcome to the show, Patricia. Thank you. I'm so excited. This is FBG Margo and on the line today, we have FBG Jen. Hey. And we have FBG Kristen. Hola. Patricia, we're just going to jump right in. And I want you to talk about the Intensati method. What was the impetus to create the program? And how does it differ from other fitness methods? Well, I created it, you know, I have to give a little bit of a backstory. So um, I'm from Northern California, one of 11 kids. I'm the ninth child eight girls and three boys. And I always start because it's interesting, I think, to see the environment uh, that took me on this, that started me on this journey. And uh, I remember being eight years old and my mom, who obviously had many kids, was very, um, she bought very much into this idea that our appearance is our social currency. And for her, she had a real fear that if a woman wasn't beautiful or didn't have a nice body, that life was going to be hard for her. And so when I was eight years old, I remember her taking me into the bathroom and weighing me and having this look of like fear and shock when she saw the number. The number was 130 pounds. And I ha I feel like that was a moment that this kind of trance of unworthiness, this spell was put on me where I got this fear from her and I translated that into, oh my gosh, I'm not okay. Like something is wrong with me, how I am, this body as it is. And then in the consecutive years, she took me to diet doctors and, and weight watchers. And I just remember going to this one diet doctor once where the thing they were doing at that time was injecting cow's urine into your bloodstream because supposedly it was it was speeding up your metabolism. And then on the other side, for adults like her, would give her get them give them also amphetamines, you know, diet pills that would just like annihilate their hunger for days and days and days. Obviously, she didn't give me those, but I learned to steal them later. But over my probably young adult life until I was about twelve, I just kept gaining weight, not losing weight, and ended up being about two hundred and twelve pounds. And that was before I got into high school. And then I remember my older sister took me to a jazzercise class. And I walked into this jazzercise class and it was life changing for me. I'd always wanted to be a dancer. I loved music. I loved movement. But I was one, my mom was never going to take us to anything. There were so many of us. It just wasn't a possibility. And I always had in my mind, I was too fat to be a dancer, but this was going to solve this problem, right? I was strong. I was coordinated. I loved it. And it was this moment that I was like, this eureka moment. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach these classes and then it's going to combine everything I love. It's going to get my body in shape. It's going to give me an opportunity to create and to dance and to move. And I felt this moment of this exercise being medicine for me, being really a, a healing agent because it gave me a voice. I was able to feel like I was good at something and my body started to change and people started to like applaud me for it and give me attention for it. And I thought, wow, this is really the ticket. And I taught starting in high school and right away classes got packed. I lived in Sil near Silicon Valley. So we were, I was teaching in these very kind of she, she Silicon Valley health clubs and classes were packed and my career was moving forward quickly and I started to get into um, endurance aerobics competitions. So not like the bikini competitions, but the endurance and fitness competitions and moved to New York City and my career is taking off. And I'm teaching like aerobics, high and low impact aerobics, step aerobics, kickboxing, kind of really the whole gamut of the fitness classes that were popular at that time. And just to give you a kind of a background, my career was pretty much like at the highest end. I was the highest paid instructor in New York City. I was the first one to get insurance. I was wooed over by Equinox when they first opened their first location. And they were like, we're going to get you an apartment. Just come over. And I was heralded as the best instructor in New York year after year after year. I was like riding high. And... 
what, what, what people didn't know at the time was, you know, my body was getting fit. I, at my highest was 212 and at my like fittest in my competition days was 140 and 140 for me was like ripped, right? Like almost impossible to sustain and not to mention the way that I was training my body and getting it into this kind of extreme shape was working out up to eight hours a day. I was binging and purging. I was using pretty much anything and any way to try to keep my body in a shape that I thought was uh, representative of success. And I linked my body to love, admiration, right? If I have the right body, I'm going to have success. I'm going to have um, everything that I want. And it really made me anxious and depressed. I literally would barely leave my apartment. I'd just go and teach class and come home. I would only go grocery shopping like really off hours because I was so afraid that anybody would see any food in my cart and be like, what are you doing eating? How could you? Like, it was so crazy. And I kind of knew it was crazy, but I couldn't get out of it. And then I got my dream job. And my dream job was to be the host of a daily live workout show. And this to me, I thought, wow, like you don't get better than this. This means I have made it. This is a national TV show. It was something I'd always wanted to do. I got super fit again to get the job. And about a year into it, the executive producer calls me into his office. I get the phone call and it's after the show and I'm about to go home. And he calls me into his office and my heart was pounding out of my chest. Like I felt like I was walking to my execution because I knew what was coming. And I got into his office and I sat in the chair and he sat across from me and in the nicest, kindest way he could possibly muster up, made reference that my weight was not okay, that I had <laughs> too much weight. And I really felt like I was, I just, I died. Like the shame spiral was so fast and so deep and so strong. I literally wanted to just hide in my apartment. And I thought, I, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so I did this in, on national TV right here. I thought, you know, I'm hiding all of these things I'm doing behind the scenes. Here I am. I'm promoting health and wellness and diet and exercise. It's the answer and lose the weight and have a great body and you'll have a great life. And here I am preaching all of this, but I'm deceiving myself and I'm deceiving other people because I am dieting and I'm exercising probably harder than most people. I'm like a national champion, fitness endurance champion. Like this is not somebody who lacks strength or willpower, or discipline. Yet, I was losing at this game, and I was mortified that somebody would find out. And now I thought, well, there we go. Now the whole nation found out. And even though I was being flooded with fan mail and thank you letters, it didn't matter. So I went home, and I ended up that night getting in a taxi and going down to kind of a shady part of New York City. I was living in New York City at the time. And I went into this apartment building, kind of put a hoodie over my head so that nobody would notice me or recognize me. And I knocked on the door. And when the guy opened the door, I handed him cash and he handed me a little plastic bag of white powder. And that white powder was crystal meth. And that was my diet aid. That's what I had gotten to because my mantra was thin at any cost and I actually meant it. It had nothing to do with health, had nothing to do with anything other than trying to fit into this ideal, trying to be the ideal, trying to sell this ideal and prove to people, yes, it is possible and I'm the one, I've got it. Yet here I am behind the scenes doing crazy, crazy stuff to get my body to look a certain way. And I lied in my bed that night and I put the, <clears throat> excuse me, 
I put the powder in my drawer and I just lied there and started thinking about what I was doing, like where I was in this crossroads. And I'd already been teaching for about 15 years. And this, I had had the eating disorder for that long, for sure. And I was crying and scared and worried, like, what is going to happen now? And all I could think of is like, get back on the treadmill, get back on the diet and exercise treadmill. What else is there to do? You just must have to work harder. What's wrong with you? Just try again. There's just like one day you're going to be able to just, just do it. And you know, if you need to use this, you need to use this. And as I lied down and I was, I was crying, crying. And I thought, how could this be? And somehow I had the idea and I, I really call it a moment of grace, but having this idea, like I know the statistics, I know that one tenth of 1% of millions of people that try to lose weight through diets and exercise, keep it off. One tenth of 1% that women especially start five or six diets a year, a year. And that this is not something that is working. And I'm not the only one. And that one thought, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. I am not weak. I am not dumb. It's not that I don't want this. What is wrong here? It cannot be that we are all just lazy and undisciplined and don't have the willpower or don't have the desire. It can't be true. And I am done deceiving myself. I'm done selling this ideal. I'm done selling something that I know deep in my heart doesn't work. I'm done selling this fat phobic mentality that unless we look a certain way where we don't have worthiness or we're not beautiful and I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. And I'm not willing to hide in a small little area where I just teach these classes to a few people and hope nobody ever even cares anymore. But I had this passion, this feeling of like, that's it. I'm putting my stake in the ground. There's something missing in this recipe. Otherwise, this something would be working. And I decided in that moment that from then on, I was going to devote my life to figuring this out and to finding a way to help people really achieve whatever their real goal was and in a sustainable way. But that this diet and exercise and trying to fit this ideal and seeing our body as social currency and self-objectifying all the time and thinking that every single day waking up with this goal to lose weight and how much energy that's robbing from my life and other people's lives and how absolutely distorted this idea is that if I don't lose five more pounds that I'm not worthy of whatever it is I believe I'm searching for. It just was like rock bottom done. It's I, I can't. So I decided I was just going to go train and learn and try to find the answer to this question. How do we really create change in our lives in alignment with what we're really, really looking for? Is it really the weight or is it something more? And I was at a workshop um, in Fiji with Deepak Chopra. He was giving the lecture and it was all a wellness um, workshop that we were on. And one of the things that he said was, you'll always have to live true to your self-concept. No matter what you do, no matter what you change, like a magnet, your life will always, always reflect what your self-concept is. And your self-concept is really your identity. Whatever you say after the words, I am becomes your identity and your life will always reflect your self-concept. And that stuck with me. And then later I was in the shower and I'm like getting ready and I'm thinking about that. And I had this like epiphany and I thought, oh my God, oh my God, like 
every day since as long as I can remember being a young girl saying, I'm so fat. I have to diet. I'm so fat. I better go work out. I'm so fat. I have to try again. I'm so fat. I better keep going. I'm so fat. I'm so fat. I better blah, blah, blah. And I just thought, oh my God, like no matter how thin I got, I always still, whether it was five pounds or 60 pounds, the affirmation was the same always. And it was, it was like this, this something cracked open in me when I really got, oh my gosh, my words are that powerful. What I say about myself. And he was also talking about how we upgrade our self-concept. What does it take to upgrade your self-concept? How do we do this? And he was describing that it is possible. You have to remember that the self-talk that you, that you have going on is what's declaring your destiny because you're always hearing it. You're always believing it. And you just write it into the neural pathways of your brain. And the things that you constantly say about yourself to yourself becomes your destiny. And I was like, holy cow, that is freaking crazy. But I could really see the evidence of that clearly in my life. But that still didn't give me the answer. And so I continued and continued training and reading books lined with information. And I ended up at a Tony Robbins event in the Bahamas. And it was one of the conversations he's talking about, about, you know, don't focus on changing your behavior, focus on changing your state. And the way that you change your state is you have to remember that how you feel is the result of what you're focusing on, what you're saying and how you're moving your body. And so if you want to activate a positive state, then you have to align your focus on something positive. You have to speak positively and you have to put your body in a shape and a posture, a shoulders back, smile in your face, move with energy, and you can evoke this energy from within you. So don't force the behaviors to change, change your state, and then the behaviors will change. And I thought, gosh, this is really, really powerful. This is, there's something here. I still didn't have the answer, but I thought there's, there's something here. And we're marching on the beach. There's literally hundreds of us marching on the beach. It was like six o'clock at night and all of us are marching what he calls our incantations. And, and he, I remember him clearly just saying incantations are not affirmations. They're, they're affirmations that help you emotionalize these statements so that they become an experience because without the emotion, the affirmation doesn't work. And incantations are the basis of everything I teach. It's the basis of all my success. It's the basis of everything that you're learning here. And if you're not doing incantations, you are not doing the work that I'm teaching. So all of this is kind of in the background, but we're marching and we're all chanting, all I need is within me now. All I need is within me now. All I need is within me now. And all of a sudden, I literally stopped dead in my tracks, like a lightning bolt came down and I just, I was like, oh my God, that's it. That's it. That's how we change our self-concept. But you can't just know this information. It needs to become consistent daily practice. This is not something you do with an idea. It's something you do with consistency. You can't change overnight. You have to do this with repetition and emotion and consistency. I am going to create a workout that combines my expertise in fitness with incantations or affirmations so that not only are we training the body, but what we're learning is how to exercise our true power to direct and control our mind towards the attainment of what we really, really want. Our mind has to change and then our body and our life will follow. And even though so many of us think, yes, what we think about, we bring about, yes, our thoughts create our reality. Yes. Uh, you can't build a ne- positive life with a negative mind. We know this, but it's very hard to live like this. And especially if you don't have a consistent practice. So I created intensati, which is sati meaning mindfulness and intention meaning intention, keeping your awareness on the true intentions that you have and aligning thoughts, words, and actions to support that intention from the creative process, right? Not just going through life, but as a conscious co-creator of your state and of your fate. And I created intensati, which looks like if you're looking in the window in an intensati class, 
It kind of looks like an aerobics meets a kickboxing class with a little bit of yoga at the beginning at the end. But if you open the door in an intensity class, you will be blown away because it's everybody who is you're vocalizing these statements so that it creates energy and experience within you so that you're learning to rewrite that inner conversation, create new neural pathways in the brain and literally interrupt the old programming of whatever. I'm so fat. I'm so fat. I'm so fat. I'm so fat. I can't do it. I hate my body. It's never going to work. I don't know how and lay new tracks so that you're creating a visual and a mental and a spiritual map to the future that you are wanting to live into. And that's how I created Intense Sati and why I created it. Dude. Um, <laughs> sometimes I don't have any words. I just say dude. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was so powerful. Uh, I actually, I went to a class years ago and there was a gal in Kansas City who was teaching it. And I remember I, I'd like seen, and this was, I'd have to pull up what year, like, God, probably like 2010, I would think. So like quite a while ago. But I remember going to the class and maybe not being fully, like, I was into it, but I wasn't, like, fully prepared for how I would respond. Uh -huh. um, and when you talk about those actions, you know, um, meeting up with the emotions and the affirmations and everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I like, immediately started seeing some of the affirmations with the workout and I love the movements. But I... I was like, am I going to be the only one standing here crying? Really? It's like, no one else is going to just stand here and cry. Um, in a really good cleansing way. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people cry. Yeah. It was, but it was very, it was very powerful. Um, and it really, it really, really stuck with me. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about spiritual fitness. You talked on this, but there is um, something that, that you'd written before that said, I know that we cannot solve a spiritual problem with a physical solution. Right. which is just, you know, a truth bomb of all truth bombs, which is so true. Can you maybe talk a little bit about more of the idea of spiritual fitness and that kind of yeah. shift? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we think of physical fitness. Everybody knows what that is. You get your body to do things on a continuous basis and you get better fitness. You want to be a better swimmer, you swim. You want to be a better tennis player, you play tennis. And um, there's something called the law of specificity. If you want to get better at tennis, you play tennis. You don't go swimming. Swimming doesn't help you become a better tennis player. So when you think of the law of specificity, you also want to think about that in related to our thought process or our, or how we deal with our, our selves and our life from that mental standpoint and emotional standpoint. And often we want to lose weight or we want to get fit because we actually want to love ourselves more. We actually think that we are going to be more lovable, uh, more beautiful, more whatever the word is, whatever you want to put after that goal as to why you want it. But if you've ever lost weight or if you've ever achieved a goal that you thought was going to make you happier or make you feel more confident or make you feel more whole, you've probably realized that if you only did it through the physical means it didn't happen because even though the outside changes, it doesn't necessarily mean the inside changes. So if we want uh, this kind of spiritual fitness, to me, spiritual fitness means you can handle the ups and downs. You know how to direct your mind. You know that when you're in a state of stress or worry or doubt that you can bring awareness to that and that you have tools to direct this part of yourself and your life. And since your spiritual life, your thoughts, everything that I call that everything that's invisible, right? It's, it's the part of you that, that is more than just the body. It's the soul. It's the mind. It's the heart. It's the feeling of purpose. It's our passion, our love. And it's also like all the negative stuff too, the fears and. When we see ourselves as more than a body and we start to understand that whatever is in the physical world, our body, 
our life, the things that we have, the types of relationships that we have, the, the wealth we have, those are all physical things, but they all have their root in the spiritual. Everything that we have in our life be started as an idea, started as a concept, started as a wish or started as a fear. Everything that we have in our life was first a thought, was first a belief. And so if we want our life to change, our physical life to change, we have to go to the root. So you guys have, what is your tagline? You can't live a healthy life by hating it? No. Yeah, what you, is can't it? Hate, you can't hate yourself healthy. You yeah. can't hate yourself healthy, right? It just doesn't work. It's like trying to say, I'm going to drop this pen and it's going to go up in the air this time for sure right? It just, it's a law. You can, it's, you sow the seed of an apple. You're not going to get a banana tree. You're going to get an apple. So if you want to be happier, if you want to be more positive, if you want to love yourself more, if you want to feel more worthy, you got to sow the seeds of worthiness. You got to sow the seeds of happiness. You got to sow the seeds of joy. You can't wait to lose the weight to feel like you love your body. You love your body. And then you're more likely to do the behaviors that lead to you actually physically loving your body because it's not about a number on a scale. So the spiritual solution is going back to the roots of what it, to the roots of whatever is physical. So if you want a healthier body, it has to start with healthier thoughts. It has to start with you focusing on what you love, of what's right, of what you can do, of what is possible. You can't uh, contemplate how things get healthier by focusing on all of the things that make you unhealthy. So that's what I mean by you need, we need a spiritual solution so that everything that's physical can mirror what it is we actually really want. Okay. So this is, I'm not sure how this question will go. So if it's kind of a bust, um, we can move on. I've got other really good <laughs> ones. Um, cause it's, it's in my head, but it's a little jumbly. Okay. Um, but you know, because you, you talked about, you know, sowing those seeds of happiness and, you know, and, and specificity. But I know that there, I, I, I have friends and I know people who struggle with finding what it is that's going to make them happy outside of this one goal about which they've been obsessed mm. for so long. You know, it's like, it's, it's like when you ask somebody, well, what is it that you really want? And they've focused their entire life on what it is that they don't want. Mm -hmm. They, they really struggle to come up with what it is that they do because they've always framed it around what it is that they don't want. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if you have a couple of like really nice tangible suggestions, either for ways that people can find their path toward actually figuring out what it is they want, or if there are just things that, um, things that you've seen with your clients and, you know, with the people you've worked with, or maybe that you've experienced personally, um, you know, what are, what are things that you find that people do you find that they want once they realize that their their real goal isn't about looking cute in a bikini? Um, Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Like we all have those things, right? I, I think it's really difficult to not have those things. Like, yeah, I would love yeah. to snap my fingers and be, you know, 20 pounds lighter and super fit or be in the body I was at my best. So sometimes we can have these desires that they're not challenged or they're not questioned or we don't dive deep enough into them uh, to actually really decide if it's really true because there's a price for everything. There's a price for everything. And sometimes I think people walk around with these ideas of like, it'd be great if I was thinner. It would be great if I lived in a different house. It'd be great if I had a different job or, di or made more money. But when you start really going, okay, but what's the price I pay? So for me, what's the price I pay to lose 10 pounds that I would love to lose if I could snap my fingers. Well, it actually is not a price I'm willing to pay at this time in my life. So then I have to go with, well, then what's the real goal? What's the real goal that I think losing the 10 pounds would give me? And honestly, that's just a comfort in my body and a knowing that my worthiness and the success of my life as a mother, as a writer, as a speaker, as a teacher does not depend on my weight or that number on the scale or if my muscles in my arms are 
big and strong or lean or flabby. It's really going deeper into that conversation of like, okay, but why do you want it? Now, what's the price I'd have to pay for that? Am I willing to pay that price? If the answer is yes, then you work to achieve that. If the answer is no, then you say, okay, I'm going to move on. But ultimately what we all want from that weight loss or that job or that relationship is a feeling. And this is the message that I really, really, really want to get across is that go down to the feeling. Why do you want that goal? I want to feel happier. I want to feel loved. I want to feel valued. I want to feel seen. I want to feel important. I want to feel sexy. And then say, well, how can you awaken that feeling right here, right now, today? And it's possible right? It's totally possible to awaken any feeling. That's where the nugget from the Tony Robbins comes from, right? I can awaken a feeling of love by thinking about people I love, by appreciating and loving the body that I have, by loving myself for all of the things that I've accomplished up until this point. It's an ability to direct your thinking towards what it is the real goal is. Because if you learn to awaken a feeling, if you learn to feel whole before you have the health, then the health will come. If you learn to feel confident before you get that job that you think is going to make you feel confident, then you've already won because in order to get that job that's going to make you feel confident, you already have to feel confident and you have to understand that you can learn and activate these feelings independently of your circumstances. We've got to learn to think independently of our circumstances and say, I'm closing my eyes to what is because that's already a result. And I have to go in and start activating the feelings that I actually want to experience today independent of my circumstances. And those become the seeds to the future that I actually am wanting to consciously live into. So that's what I mean when you're sowing the seeds, learning to think independently of your circumstances and become the master of your state and then allow life to unfold from that place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Love this show? Tell us why in a five-star review on iTunes, and we'll read it on the air. Also, make sure you are a subscriber. If you want to reach out to say hi or have a question about a recent episode, yay, well, feel free to email us at podcast at fitbottomgirls.com. And if this podcast jives perfectly with your brand, consider sponsoring the show. Get more info by emailing advertising at fitbottomgirls.com. Find all kinds of Fit Bottom goodness online and on social media at Fit Bottom Girls, Fit Bottom Mamas, Fit Bottom Eats, and Fit Bottom Zen. And if books and movies are your thing, check out the other podcast I co-host called Book vs. Movie, which you can find anywhere where you search for podcasts. Thanks for listening.